गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एंड वेलकम डॉक्टर अन्नपूर्णा गुड मॉर्निंग सो नाइस टू सी यू हियर ऑन दिस प्लेटफॉर्म Uh, so i uh, firstly i welcome you on behalf of petroleum university uh, sorry parul university as well as petroleum engineering department okay so this particular webinar is a part of our uh, online programs so that's why we have been we have invited you to deliver a talk uh, on this particular topic of shale gas so for viewers i would like to give you all a short introduction of dr anupurna she is basically a petroleum geologist uh, she has uh, she is uh, an alumni of the ms university of baroda and presently she is uh, working as assistant professor in university of petroleum and energy studies in dehradun okay uh, she is a very good petroleum geologist she has done a lot of i mean tremendous work and detailed work on shale gas in india he has also generated huge amount of data on the particular aspect of shale gas now you you uh, if you are all people uh, who are students especially who are a petroleum engineering student they know that shale gas is not uh, among the traditional hydrocarbons okay so it has been recently uh, came into limelight that shale gas is very much important and that should be explored okay so very few people are working on this particular aspect and dr anapurna is one of them so now i'll directly uh, ask anapurna to uh, start the webinar and if you people are having any questions you people can directly send it to me on my uh, number it could be whatsapp or text message both okay so anapurna you can thank you very much uh, am i audible yeah you are perfectly audible yes okay thank you dr vishal and thank you uh, parul institute of technology for inviting me for this talk and thank you all the participants also uh, and very good morning to all of you i am dr annapurna borua an assistant professor at the university of petroleum and energy studies so i'll be talking about unconventional shale gas resources exploration and exploitation mainly i will cover uh, most of the part of exploration and little bit about exploitation because the topic is very vast so i will give you brief idea and will try to explain the things you can ask and if you have any question you can ask after the session uh my slides are visible yes it's visible perfectly okay thank you so unconventional shale gas exploration and exploitation the term unconventional refers to the reservoirs that are generally difficult to develop it requires large stimulation treatment or enhanced recovery techniques in order to produce and recover economic volume of hydrocarbon from it the basic idea behind this presentation is to give you introduction about shale gas what is shale gas how it generates what are the controlling factors of shale gas and why the shale gas is so much important for the energy requirement then the third we'll discuss different uh, approach multidisciplinary approach including geochemical geological petrophysical then we'll discuss uh, indian case studies and how to estimate the reservoir in the shale gas uh, reserve in shale gas reservoir then hydrofracturing little bit about hydrofracturing we'll discuss and then conclusion so this uh, triangular diagram is known as resource triangle Uh, so the triangular diagram shown here is a resource triangle and as you progress from the top to bottom you can see the volume increase increases at the top you have conventional reservoirs conventional reservoirs small volumes and easy to develop but unconventional reservoirs these are larger volumes and difficult to develop from top to bottom uh, price is increasing porosity will decrease 
and it will require improved technology to extract these unconventional resources. So from this triangular diagram itself, you can identify how much volume we have for the unconventional reservoirs. Uh, in the second figure, you can see tight gas, 7%, conventional oil, 20% uh, of energy demand is fulfilling by 23% of energy demand is fulfilling by conventional oil, 8% is fulfilling by conventional gas, then 19% by heavy oil, bituminous oil, we have 15%, CVM, 12%, and shale gas, 16%. So these are the examples of unconventional resources. Here, tight oil reservoirs and uh, tight gas reservoirs are also considering under the unconventional reservoirs. And shale gas, heavy oil, CBM, gas hydrate, oil shale, these are the unconventional resources. Uh, the basic reservoir parameters of unconventional reservoirs are uh, mostly unknown and very difficult to determine with high degree of accuracy. In addition, individual well results can be very challenging to predict the flow. But the unconventional deposits often cover an extended area and it also depends on different geological structures. Here you can see okay. as the conventional reservoirs are porous and permeable, these are the high quality reservoirs. As the porosity will decrease from right to left, you can see porosity will decrease. In the tight gas reservoirs, you will get less porosity, uh, less permeability. And in the unconventional reservoir, you will get uh, very less permeability. So permeability will decrease from the conventional to unconventional. So unconventional reservoirs are mostly the tight reservoirs, which require advanced technique uh, to extract the hydrocarbon economically. So advanced techniques include like horizontal drilling, multi-phase hydrofracturing. So these are the techniques required for commercial hydrocarbon exploration from the unconventional reservoirs. Now, what is shale gas? Shale gas is the natural gas which is present in the shale rock. As you know, shale is uh, one of the uh, most, shale is the source rock, main source rock for hydrocarbon exploration, where hydrocarbon generate and after getting a proper maturity, hydrocarbon migrate from the source rock to the reservoir rock. But in all cases, hydrocarbon cannot migrate from the source rock to reservoir rock. There may not be present any reservoir rock at the top of the uh, shale layer. And the secondly, 100% hydrocarbon cannot migrate from the source rock to the reservoir rock. So in that case, those hydrocarbon which are entrapped inside the shale layer, that will be remained for a long time. And if it is commercial, then uh, the shale will act as reservoir for that unconventional reservoir. So here I will explain you. In this diagram, you can see a typical petroleum system here, conventional deposits. And if you go towards right, you can see there is no any reservoir trap. There is no anticlinal structure or no fault. So that which will act as trap for the petroleum system. So if hydrocarbon generate in the source rock, if it get uh, proper maturity, then hydrocarbon will migrate from the source rock to reservoir rock. And in this zone, it will accumulate. So here you have source rock, reservoir rock, cap rock. You have a proper reservoir trap, which is helping in entrapment of this hydrocarbon. So this is the proper petroleum system. For, un uh, for conventional, we will drill the petroleum system where there is source rock, reservoir rock, and cap rock. We'll drill up to the reservoir rock. But not necessary everywhere in this, as just above this shale layer, you will get reservoir rock. The shale is extending throughout this area, throughout this basin, or throughout this field. 
but there is no entrapment or no reservoir present or no anticline present in this part so where the hydrocarbon will go if there is microfracture fall then hydrocarbon will release and will escape but if there is no microfracture then the hydrocarbon will remain inside the source rock and in that case the source rock will act as a reservoir rock and that is known as shale gas reservoir so these are the region how gas accumulate how the source act as reservoir for the unconventional shale gas so it is in situ hydrocarbon gas present in organic rich fine grain shale shale can be source reservoir and shield for the gas and it should contain minimum 2 weight percent of total organic carbon for the conventional we require minimum 0.5 weight percent of total organic content and for in case of unconventional shale gas reservoir we require minimum 2% to 2 weight percent of total organic carbon the source rock may be thermally matured matured or post matured and the gas may be thermogenic origin biogenic origin and mixture of both in in shale gas reservoirs gas can be present as free gas in the pore space in the natural fractures and it can be adsorbed on the rock surface and it can be pre also present as dissolved gas so here also you can see in case of conventional reservoir the well is drilled up to the reservoir rock but in case of unconventional shale gas well is drilled up to the source rock then uh, vertically drilled up to the targeted zone then horizontal drilling okay well is horizontal and multiple hydro hydro fracturing is uh, hydro, this tiny fractures are created you have to inject water at high pressure and that pressure will help uh, to create some tiny fractures and these fractures will help to uh, gas flow from the uh, reservoir rock to the surface so conventional wells are drilled up to the reservoir rock and unconventional wells are drilled up to the source rock and you can see in case of unconventional reservoir you do not require any reservoir rock cap rock or entrapment or petroleum system the shale layer itself will act as source reservoir and cap now what is the big deal in case of shale gas reservoirs you can see the shale revolution was started in uh, here the red color is indicating tight gas purple color is coal bed methane then Um, yellow color is indicating shale gas the shale gas revolution was started in 2010 and you can see how it is increasing how the production is in increasing and you can see the projected production uh, up to 2035 so obviously the potential of unconventional shale gas resources is far beyond that of conventional resources that does uh, it has a great prospect for future shale gas is the fastest growing uh, source of us natural gas uh, the energy information administration predicts that shale gas will count for nearly half of us natural gas production in 2040 which is less than 10% which was less than 10% in 2011 but these are difficult uh, to extract economically there are some challenges and we'll be discussing how uh, uh, the shale gas parameters can be evaluated and how to identify the shale gas prospect for exploration here you can see the shale gas prospective map worldwide the first uh, here you can see the china is estimated to have world's largest shale gas reserve The first commercial shale gas well was drilled in US in 1821 in Fredonian, New York, uh, and it was uh, the shale gas well producing from Devonian Fredonian shale formation. After the great economic success of Barnett Shale Play in Texas, the interest had spread in search of other sources of shale gas. I um, mean, in other areas for shale gas across uh, the other parts of United States, Canada, Europe, Asia, and Australia. 
uh, and measure shale gas production from us here you can see this is us shale gas production map and this is in prospective shale gas uh, basins in india so in us uh, majority of gas pro shale production came from four basins those are san juan basin uh, new mexico antrim basin of michigan appalachian ohio shales and barnett shales of four toward basin North America is also leading uh, the worldwide uh, shale gas production with US and Canada. In India, we have identified a uh, few basins which are having shale gas prospect. India has identified mainly six basins for shale gas exploration. Those are Kambe Basin, okay, here Kambe Basin, Assam Arakan Basin, Gondwana basins. In Gondwana basins, uh, there are Permian shales which are organically rich, maturity is good, and they are present at shallow depth. Uh, so, which are having very good prospect for hydrocarbon, uh, prospect for shale gas exploration. Then, Krishna Godavari basin, Kaberi, Kaberi onshore, Indo Gangetic uh, basins, and these are classified as a prospective shale gas basin in Rajasthan also there are some literatures where Rajasthan is also identified that uh, there are prospect in some part of this basin and these are the main prospective basins but but uh, most of the works are done research works have been done in Kambe basin uh, then um, Kambe basin then Damodar Valley basins and Krishna Godavari basin in perspective of shale gas exploration in 2000, shale gas provided by 1% of US natural gas production. By 2010, it was 20%. And it is expected that, it is predicted that in, by 2035, 46% of US natural gas demand will be fulfilled by shale gas. In India also, it is estimated that 290 uh, trillion cubic feet shale gas reserves are present and out of this technically recoverable amount is uh, 63 trillion cubic feet but these are uh, based on few basins only as i have told you most of the uh, research were carried on uh, restricted on few basins only if we do um, exhaustive investigation then this uh, this uh, value will definitely increase but in all these basins, shales are very heterogeneous and there are uh, lots of challenges. That is why India is not producing commercial shale gas yet. Only the pilot projects were done. Uh, the first India's first pilot project on shale gas was done in Damodar Valley Basin in Rani Ganjfil. And Kambe Basin also few wells were drilled for uh, as, a, as a pilot project. But commercial shale gas exploration is not done yet in India and it, in future it will be uh, done. Uh, but because the shales are, shale gas reservoirs are very heterogeneous and they require different uh, type of typical um, unconventional techniques. They require um, understanding um, widely uh, to in, apply uh, advanced technology for exploration of this shale gas resource. That is why it is very important to understand the shale um, layers, shale reservoirs. So, in the, um, just say, as I told you, shales are very heterogeneous. Here you can see different types of shales. In the first image, this is the fissile shale. You can see uh, from the outcrop also, it can be identified that this is uh, very fragile and you can see the laminated shells here and then the, in this image you can see massive and hard shells so hardness increases from year to year if it is massive it is very hard to um, uh, be very hard and it is difficult to break down for hydro uh, it is not brittle it is ductile so it is difficult for hydrofracturing um, so shale sedimentology play a very important role in case of exploration and exploitation uh, because hydrofracturing and horizontal drilling, these are the key factor for successful shale gas exploration. And for horizontal, uh, for hydrofracturing, we require brittle shales, um, which are easily breakable. But uh, you, you have to understand 
what is the type of shell before going to uh, produce hydrocarbon from the shell or you have to identify the favorable faces you may have 100 meter thickness for example 100 meter thickness of shell layer but you cannot go for hydrofracturing for all those 100 meter you have to identify what are the faces present in the shell formation there may be uh, silty faces there may be carbonaceous rich faces there may be hard uh, that i have shown you hard shell layers there may be uh, very fragile shell layers and uh, there may be laminated shell layers. So you have to identify different faces based on different techniques, laboratory techniques, well log techniques. Okay, after that only you can find out which is the most favorable shell faces for um, shell gas target or for uh, perforation. And you, here you can see shell parameters vary. As I told you, it is very heterogeneous. Uh, a parameters vary from basin to basin, from field to field. Even within the same shell formation, you may have different type of faces. These all images are taken from Burnet shell. And you can see the color variation. First, you can see the color variation due to mineral content. Actually, these are outcrops. So there are some weathering effect also. But still, you can see the second one, figure B, is uh, this is a uh, black color which is indicating that this is highly rich in total organic content and here in the uh, image c these are comparatively hard shells tight shells and uh, this one is taken from core uh, photograph these are core photographs and you can see the color variation this is very dark uh, black color and showing it is rich in organic content carbon content which is very uh, required parameter for shale gas exploration as I told you, it must have a minimum 2 weight percent of total organic content. Uh, so, and you can see these are uh, very fragile nature of shells. So you can see how much variation uh, in shells. Outcrop shells are different from the subsurface shells. And on outcrop also, there are so much variation, different type of shell faces within the same shell, Barnett shell. So that is why it is important to understand about it is important to do investigation and identification of different faces in shell. Color also play uh, actually based on color you can identify before going to do any detailed investigation from the color you can identify how much total organic content is there and you can get some uh, basic information from the color. Actually color of shell is depend on presence of organic matter and other min minerals. So a minor amount of organic matter and iron can significantly alter the color of shells. This color difference is only the state of oxidation of iron. A black color in a black color shell indicates that it is uh, having high amount of organic content and it was deposited in reducing environment. So like that, you may have different color of shales and which will indicate uh, the presence of mineral content and their depositional environment. Here you can see color variation of entrim shell. It is almost yellow type of shell, entrim shell. And Barnett shell is almost dark black to gray color. And based on the mineral content, shales are basically composed of clay minerals, different types of clay minerals like uh, montmorillonite, elite, kaolinite, smectite, and their uh, shells are composed of other minerals like quartz, chart, feldspar, and it is uh, it have other constituents, organic matter, carbonate minerals, iron oxide, sulfide minerals, and heavy minerals. So clay and silicate minerals, then these are the main component of uh, shells. Okay, it is composed of clay minerals, silicate minerals, it may be having carbonate minerals, uh, then sulfide minerals and heavy minerals. Based on their mineralogy, you can identify brittle shale and ductile shales. Uh, why it is important? But because brittle shales are good for hydrofracturing and ductile shales are um, uh, ductile shells are not favorable for hydrofracturing. So based on the min ratios of uh, mineral content like carbon, clay mineral and quartz feldspar ratios, this is the triangular di diagram. Uh, and based on this diagram, you can classify the shells. Uh, if the carbonate ratio is high, then it is known as calcareous dolomitic mudstone. If uh, um, the clay, it has 
uh, 50% clay, 50% carbonate. Then this range is known as argillaceous marlstone. Then argillaceous, uh, uh, then siliceous feldspathic marlstone. If it is having more than more silica content than clay content, then it is um, the classified as silica feldspathic marlstone. If it is having carbonate and quartz feldspar is. Uh, shell. So based on these ratios, using this triangular uh, diagram, mineral diagram, uh, different shells are classified. Here you can see Bacon shells, Barnet shell. I'll tell you about Barnet shell. These are uh, these are classified as siliceous mudstone. Then uh, these are the Thailand oil shells, and these are classified as argillaceous marlstone. So, like that, different shells are classified based on carbonate, clay, and quartz feldspar ratios. So, if it, it is considered that if it, it is having quartz content, high quartz content, then shells are more brittle. So, siliceous shells are more brittle than the clay rich uh, shells. So, here also in this diagram, also you can see uh, these are the mostly producing shale gas producing cells eagle ford shells which is having uh, high carbonate content then bowland shells these are having high silica content uh, then ohio shells these are having clay and organic rich content and quartz content and less carbonate content uh, like that you can classify the shell types based on this triangular diagram based on the ratios of quartz feldspar uh, then I um, mean silicate, carbonate, and clay mineral mineral ratios. As I told you, clay is the main component of shales, other than quartz, organic matter, and other carbonate minerals. So, so clay plays very important role. Shale swelling is a challenging. As uh, I think, as a petroleum engineers, they uh, all of you know, the clay plays very important role in case of uh, sh drilling. Also, shale swelling is a challenge in oil and gas industries. Over seventy percent of formations drilled for petroleum exploration and production are comprised of shale, and it causes about seventy percent of well bore instability problem across the world. Okay, because shale swells rapidly on absorption absorption of water, uh, so inhibition studies are carried out for uh, to restrict the shale swelling. Inhibition is explained by possible penetration of small non-hydrated ions into the porosity of shales, and it uh, it creates some impermeable membrane and it reduce the shale swelling effect. So shale swelling is the very uh, common issues in case of conventional as well as unconventional reservoirs that is why it is very important to understand what type of shales are present here and how much percentage of uh, clays are present and they are forming what type of stacks are that means what is the diagenesis stage of the shale that is also important to understand here you can see kaolinite elite monperlonite chloride so from these taxers, you can see some clays are forming some porous space and some are very tight in nature and some are very hard for hydrofracturing. And uh, besides, beyond these uh, things, shales, a few shales are uh, swells very easily because of their molecular taxers. You can see the shale, uh, clay taxers. Here, kaolinite, it has DOT taxers. Smectites, it, these are very loose taxers, you can see, and water can easily penetrate inside the uh, atomic bond bonds and it can swell very easily. But compared to smectites, kaolinite and elite, these are the non swelling clays. So you have to understand what, what type of clay is present there and uh, how much percentage of clays present there? Then what type of structure they are forming? Because their structure is important because some some structure form enhance the porosity and some structure, uh, if they are under compaction zone, then it will reduce the porosity. So these are the important parameters you have to uh, uh, study before going uh, going to explore the shale gas reservoirs. Uh, then how does gas generate within the shale? This is the, the flow chart for conventional hydrocarbon generation. Hydrocarbon gen generate and it migrates with increasing temperature and pressure in uh, kerosene 
uh, convert into bitumen then at uh, during catagenesis stage at higher temperature and pressure hydrocarbon converted into oil then it uh, converted into gas uh, the term due to thermal cracking of uh, hydrocarbon bonds so in case of shale gas evaluation these are the uh, ge these geochemical parameters are very important uh, these are total organic carbon then vitrinite reflectance that is maturity then how much uh, gas is present then uh, thermal maturity that is tmax and total transformation of hydrocarbon transformation ratio means how much organic matter has converted into uh, oil or gas so the main uh, these three are the important factors which are the important factors first one is how much total organic carbon is present for conventional it requires minimum 0.5 percent and as told you for unconventional we require minimum two percent then what type of organic matter is there type means kerosene type if kerosene type one i'll show you the types of kerosenes so it is depend on kerosene type uh, means from where the organic matters are coming these are coming from marine lacustrine or terrestrial environment uh, so based on that it will produce oil or gas or coal and it may produce nothing so it is very important to identify the types of organic matter then third thing is thermal maturity if you have if you have hydrocarbon uh, organic matter there but uh, kerosene you have identified but it is immature not uh, uh, in mature zone then it will not produce hydrocarbon so here you can see mature immature and mature immature and post mature zones here Maturity depends on temperature, time, organic matter, quality, quantity, then rate of sedimentation. There are different maturity indicators like vitrinite reflectance, thermal alteration index, fluorescence, lopatin time temperature index. These are different techniques to identify maturity. Means how, uh, what about the maturity? Uh, in this image, you can see at immature stage, source rock will generate dry gas or biogenic gas in mature stage it will uh, produce oil and wet gas then over mature stage it will produce di dry gas uh, if the shale is producing if the shale is acting as unconventional reservoir and it is present at mature stage then the hydrocarbon will produce oil then we will be consider it as shale oil and this oil oil will get higher temperature and pressure then it will convert into gas then we will consider the shale reservoir as shale gas reservoir so these are the basic parameters for maturity uh, then total organic content i think all of you aware of these parameters if we have zero 0.5% total organic content then it is considered as poor if it has 0.5 to 1 then it is considered as fair and if it is having more than 4% then it is known as excellent source rock and like that kerosene uh, kerosenes are divided into four types type 1 type 2 type 3 and type 4 type 1 is coming from algae marine algae which can produce oil type 2 these are the uh, composition of type 2 is uh, spores, pollens, animal uh, part. So this will produce also uh, oil. And when it will get more temperature, then it, it can convert into gas. And type 3 can produce only gas. And these are the kerosene, which are or organic matter. Kerosene are the power component of organic matter. And the uh, type 3 kerosenes are coming from terrestrial plants, woods, and this can produce gas and coal. So kerosene type, total organic content percentage, and vitrinite mature, uh, means maturity. These three are the primary concern, primary uh, factor for shale gas and shale oil generation in the shale rock. So here you can see how the shale act as source, reservoir, and cap rock. Suppose you have a shale rock and where porosity is 20%, the shale is composed of, I mean, shale will contain 
uh, total organic carbon con to, uh, the solid hydrocarbon then water and kerosene and with increasing maturity increasing maturity okay, maturity will increase with increasing depth increasing maturity that uh, organic matter will convert it into oil so solid will convert to oil liquid phase and the oil will convert to gas will get uh, oil gas and solid organic matter then the oil will expel from the source rock to reservoir rock due to uh, with the help of microfractures but in some cases when there will be no microfractures or when the microfracture will fail to provide hydrocarbon escape route then what will happen the source rock will act as reservoir rock so general when organic matter converted into solid from solid to liquid phase it uh, exerts some pressure on the rock surface which creates some microfractures but sometime uh, when the microfracture will fail to provide hydrocarbon escape route from the source rock to reservoir rock in that case the source will act as reservoir so if there is oil then it will be shale oil and if there is gas then it will uh, we will call it as shale gas reservoir shale oil can be converted into shale gas reservoir with increasing uh, temperature because the oil can convert into it can uh, crack down to form gas now uh, we have studied uh, now we learn uh, came to know what are the controlling parameters total organic content porosity uh, then uh, kerosene type maturity these are the controlling parameters now how to evaluate these parameters there are different techniques first is total uh, how to uh, measure the total organic carbon content there is an instrument called leuco carbon analyzer using this uh, instrument you can uh, measure how much total carbon is present in the shale rock so in this uh, technique you can see the this is a schematic diagram of leuco carbon analyzer using this equipment you can find out how much to toc is present in the shale and for this you have to powder the sample you have to remove the carbonates by acid treatment then after combustion the sample in the presence of excess oxygen at high temperature uh, this organic carbon will convert to co2 and that co2 will be trapped and it will be recorded the volume of co2 will be recorded and uh, here you will get the total organic carbon percentage then other parameters are kerosene type and maturity now how to evaluate the kerosene type and maturity this is a rockwell pyrolysis equipment rockwell pyrolysis 6 and these equipments are is used to uh, analyze the kerosene type and maturity now how this equipment works this is a pyrolyzed uh, rockwell pyrolyzer and here oxygen uh, in absence of oxygen uh, rock samples are pyrolyzed and it will um, temperature is high here you have to uh, use uh, high temperature in absence of oxygen uh, so the temperature will in you can increase temperature up to 600 degrees celsius so in case of conventional here you have you have seen how much temperature we require right? the kerosene pro, uh, starts um, forming at 50 degree then after 60 degree 60 to 120 you will get the mature zone so that is the uh, mostly 60 to 120 degree range for oil window then gas window starts that is for conventional uh, and both unconventional temperature where the hydrocarbon will uh, where kerosene will convert to form hydrocarbon but in lab here uh, in nature it takes million year to get this maturity in nature it takes million year to convert the uh, mature stage from convert from mature to post mature stage or to convert from immature to mature uh, stage in nature it may take million years but in laboratory we are uh, pyrolyzing the source rock we are pyrolyzing the shells uh, in a in an hour or in two hours so that is the reason why we are giving more heat here so we will apply more heat in the laboratory we will apply up to 600 degree it will start from uh, 0 to 600 degree which 6 uh, degree increase temperature per minute 
and during this process of pyrolysis the uh, shell will start releasing different gases it will start to convert mm, uh, okay so here the pyrolysis is the decomposition of organic matter by heating in absence of oxygen this instrument provides a first determination of type and evolution stage of kerosene organic matter type quality uh, the, all this information we can get using van Krevelin diagram. This is one standard diagram which is used to analyze these parameters. I will show you. Okay. So here, this is the output of rock eval pyrolyzer. First image, you can see the schematic diagram of the rock eval pyrolyzer. Here you have to put uh, the samples and hydrocarbon detector is here. And with increasing temperature, as you will apply increased temperature, so temperature will increase six degrees Celsius per minute. And with that, the shell will start releasing some gases. First, it will release volatile gases or free gases, which is present inside it. Then it will start releasing pyrolysis kerosene or pyrolysis hydrocarbon gas. Then after that, it will release carbon dioxide, which will be trapped. and uh, uh these three other parameters we have to we'll get directly from rockwell pyr pyrolysis s1 s2 s3 and other parameter which we will get from directly from this rockwell pyrolysis that is t max t max is the temperature where the source rock or shell will release maximum amount of hydrocarbon here you can see the graph is increasing at a time it is releasing maximum amount of pyrolyzed hydrocarbon and after that it is again uh, the volume of rele gas releasing uh, decreases so at the highest release of hydrocarbon it is coming at a certain temperature level and that temperature is known as t max so s1 is the free hydrocarbon which is released at the initial stage of the pyrolysis then S2 is the pyrolyzed hydrocarbon gas, which is released due to thermal decomposition of kerosene. Then S3 is the CO2, no, not O2, this is CO2. And Tmax is the temperature at which maximum amount of means where we will get S2 peak. These four parameters you will directly get from rockwell pyrolysis. And from these four parameters, we can calculate hydrogen hydrogen index and oxygen index. So this is a formula to calculate hydrogen index and this is the formula for oxygen index. Now how we will utilize these parameters because based on hydrogen index and oxygen index, we can identify what type of hydrocarbon will produce from the shale. It will produce oil or gas that we can find out from the hydrogen index and oxygen index ratios. Because if uh, you know, all of you know the uh, component of hydrocarbon carbon okay hydrogen and uh, carbon and based on the hydrogen atom molecule you will get oil or gas generally if it is oil producing shells or it, if it is oil then you will get more hydrogen atom so these are the ratios of hydrogen oxygen and carbon that is why based on hydrogen index and oxygen index we will be identifying uh, what type of um, hydrocarbon the shell will produce then the second thing is maturity. Maturity can be calculated using vitrinite reflectance. This is one common technique to identify the mature, post-mature, and immature zones. Uh, here, vitrinite is the component of organic matter, and it uh, gives reflection under UV light. When the maturity increases, it starts uh, giving reflection. And with increasing maturity, the reflection will be more. So there is a standard chart for vitrina reflectance value. You can, I'll show you. I'll show you later. Uh, and these uh, parameters like Tmax and production index, Tmax, as I told you, you'll directly get it from the rock eval pyrolysis. Then production index that you have to calculate from S1 and S2 value. Why it is important? Because with increasing maturity, kerosene will convert to bitumen. Okay, and uh, from production index, you will get information uh, that what is the genetic potential of the shell. Means it is commercial or not that you can identify. Okay, now, 
maturity indicate uh, indicator another maturity indicator is pore coloration index sci scale here you can see the sci scale based on the pore color changes in the shale you can identify the maturity level here you can see the lighter color is indicating immature and with increasing maturity color is in uh, color is uh, becoming dark and at the post mature zone you will uh, get almost black color so this this is a standard shale uh, standard uh, chart and based on this you can compare your sample uh, you can analyze the spores and you can identify what is the maturity stage of your shale then this is the van Crevelin diagram here as i told you oxygen index and hydrogen index why this oxygen index and hydrogen index are important because based on this we can identify what type of kerosene is present in the shell and this is a standard diagram this curve are uh, uh, standard uh, and this is van Crevelin. this is known as van Crevelin diagram and when you will plot your samples these are two examples from marshall shell and Utica cell. Here, Marcella cells are showing that it is uh, kerosene type. It is coming under kerosene type one and kerosene type three. Okay, and Utica cells are mostly kerosene type two and three. So this in this standard diagram, when you will plot uh, your sample, uh, means the Rockwell pyrolysis data, then you will get to know what type of kerosene is present in the shell and what type of hydrocarbon it will present it will uh, contribute uh, so from this diagram you cannot understand it is at post mature or mature zone or it is at an immature zone you can identify only the kerosene type but if you use this diagram this is one another modified van Crevelin diagram here uh, temperature and temperature uh, and maturity zones are also considered in this diagram so in using this diagram you can identify both kerosene type then maturity ranges suppose here uh, you have cold samples red color is indicating cold samples and blue color is indicating shell samples and this red color cold samples are in oil window zone it is in mature zone and this is another shell samples are also at mature zone so uh, these are now kerosene type mostly kerosene type uh, shells are kerosene type 3 and uh, coals are ker both kerosene type 3 and 2 so what you can infer from this diagram the coal which is type 3 generally already you know that coal kerosene type 3 can produce coal because these are coming from terrestrial woods and plants then here shells are also kerosene type 3 and it is in oil window zone so it should present oil it should uh, produce oil right as you know that in oil window uh, source rock produce oil and in, in gas window source rock produce gas okay these are the fundamental concept but here the shale is type 3 and you know that type 3 kerosene produce only gas or coal so it will not produce oil it will produce shale gas okay i'm explaining again uh, that kerosene type 2 produce kerosene type 1 and 2 produce oil and kerosene type 3 produce gas then another thing is in mature zone so cell produce oil and in post mature zone cell produce gas but if it is kerosene type 3 because it is coming from terrestrial woods and plants so it does not matter it is in mature or post mature stage in mature stage also it can produce gas it will not produce oil because the components which is coming from terrestrial plants and woods it can produce only gas so that is why this diagram is the most important diagram when prevalent diagram based on this you can can identify what type of kerosene is there that means what type of organic matter is there from where it is coming then what is the mature stage so you can identify that the shale is uh, shell oil bearing or shell gas bearing okay so this was all about geochemical uh, geochemical technique to understand the shale gas parameters geochemical parameters like total organic content uh, then kerosene types maturity 
these three are the main parameters and you can assess those parameters using rock evil pyrolysis technique uh, now uh, you can you you can evaluate uh, the petrophysical parameters using wells well locks okay so well lock for unconventional reservoirs uh, as uh, i think all of you know there are different types of well locks like gamma spontaneous potential resistivity density newton porosity and all these locks have different applications generally gamma is used to identify the lithology uh, spontaneous potential is also used to identify the lithology actually this is a different topic very vast topic so i'll try to give you the brief about all this uh, then resistivity it will give you the, the resistive uh, fluid uh, that means it is in the porous zone it is uh, hydrocarbon is present there or water is present there that you can get information from the resistivity log then density log will give you uh, the density value of the uh, lithology and based on that you can find out uh, the low density zone uh, if it is hydrocarbon bearing then it will be density will be low and from porosity you can find out uh, that uh, the it will be having high porosity so in case of conventional reservoir also our uh, main yeah i'll uh, i'll try to draw it here so using the gamma log you can find out uh, the lithology for shale it will be high value and for sandstone it will be low value again for sealstone it will be like this uh, so you will get graphical representation of petrophysical properties with respect to depth using the well logs from the well logs so this is the signatures of gamma and you can identify shale then sandstone here and this is the sealstone shale like that using sp also you can uh, get information about the lithology then using resistivity suppose you have this is uh, sandstone layer and this is also sandstone layer s1 s2 and these are shales for resistivity shale will show resistivity like this and for hydrocarbon bearing zone you will get high resistivity then for non-hydrocarbon bearing sandstone if it is having water then it will show you low resistivity again it will depend it uh, water if the water is present then it is fresh water or saline water if it is saline water saline means it is conductive so you will get less resistivity if it is fresh water then you will get more resistivity for that zone so it is important to understand then from porosity log you will newton porosity you will get information about porosity if it is high porosity you have to identify high porosity zone then low this is the density log you will have to identify low density zone so whenever you will have any hydrocarbon bearing zone you will get a crossover of density and a neutron log and if there is gas then there will be more spacing in between these two log the, between density and neutron porosity so you have to identify high density low density and a high porosity zone so you will get the crossover so in case of shale, uh, this was uh, all about uh, conventional hydrocarbon reservoir. There are lots of advanced well logs also. I'm not discussing here. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was all about conventional reservoir, how to identify the gas bearing zone. And in case of unconventional reservoir, how will you identify? So resistivity increases uh, significantly in mature rocks okay due to generation of non-conducting hydrocarbons because hydrocarbons are non-conducting so you will get more resistivity if hydrocarbon is present in the shale and gamma log will show very high gamma value if there is high amount of total organic content then uh, for unconventional hydrocarbon reservoir uh, gamma well log value will show very high high gamma generally in case of conventional reservoir gamma value remains uh, 60 to 120 1, 120 like that and in case of unconventional uh, for example barnet shells wood for uh, shells uh, sometimes they shows 200 api gamma value uh, 250 api gamma value so you will get very high gamma ray value in case of unconventional shells because there will be more amount of organic content then resistivity will show you high resistivity 
because there will be hydrocarbon and hydrocarbon are non conducting so it will give you high resistivity value and other parameters you can uh, the technique is same like conventional you can uh, assess porosity then permeability but it is very difficult to uh, very difficult to evaluate porosity using well log in case of unconventional reservoirs because in shales pores are mostly micro to nano pores so those can be uh, those can be seen under microscope only under using high resolution microscope only so uh, what you are getting uh, in log for the shales, that porosity is not 100% accurate porosity. You have to uh, go for higher tech uh, resolution microscopic, st microscopic studies to understand about the porosity. Uh, so here, there are different techniques like PESIS method, which can be used for uh, total organic uh, content analysis from the well logs. Generally, well logs are used for petrophysical property analysis like porosity, permeability, water saturation, density, like that. But um, now uh, these logs can be used for geochemical parameter evaluation also. PESI introduced one method. This is the PESI method, TOC. Here, TOC can be calculated using delta log R. Okay, and del delta log R you will get from resistivity log and uh, porosity log. So you have to overlay resistivity log and porosity log. When you will overlay, you will get the separation. Okay. So you have to take value of resistivity value of that at that particular depth. Support, uh, suppose at uh, 2000 meter depth, we are calculating total organic content. So you have to take resistivity value at that particular point. Then you have to take the resistivity baseline value. And uh, like that, you have to take the porosity value for that particular depth and you will get this log delta log r value and this delta log r if you put here you will get total organic carbon value there are several uh, this is the first method was introduced by pesi to uh, assess um, geochemical parameter using well logs after that several researchers have developed different uh, numerical formulas like uh, uh, smoker method this is very use, um, easy technique here only density value is required using only density log you can calculate toc then another method is haslop method here gamma and resistivity logs are used so you have to use gamma and resistivity overlay and using that you can identify the hot shells okay so here you can uh, see gamma and resistivity overlay and these are the zones where shell gas is present Using gamma, this uh, you can identify the shell formations. These are the shell formation uh, shell zone. These are the shell zones, and other parts are sandstone. And uh, uh, it has it is showing. This is this graph is porosity and pH that pH that is n phi means Newton phi that is porosity log. Red color is indicating density.